we're ready. So um, let's, uh, we're going to be looking at 2 Kings chapter 2 and chapter 3 tonight. There's a lot of stuff in it. Let's pray and we will dive on in. So please pray with me. Lord, we thank you for bringing us together on this November night. Thank you, Father, for uh, the faithful ones who have gone before us, that we might be able to um, study them and read about them and also benefit from the fact that your word was recorded and copied and copied and copied and taught. And uh, Father, in this moment that we then are the inheritors of so much of your blessing and your preservation of your word, Father, we pray that your spirit would be at work and that this time that we've set aside to be before you and with your people would not be in vain. Would you open our eyes that we might see you more clearly, open our hearts, uh, soften them that we might love you more fully. And Father, we pray that you would help us to see ways that our lives are uh, out of step with you or uh, encourage us, Lord, in places where we are um, faltering in our weakness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so uh, lost dog, sparky, mixed breed, white with brown spots, slipped her collar, no tag, seen last 3 p.m. Thursday, October 27th, reward $500, please help. I'm sure that you guys have seen posters like that around and maybe you've been in a sad place to that where you've had to make one and even realize that there are templates available for you to go and use if you have a lost pet. Um, and uh, there, why are our pets, uh, dogs, cats, birds, lizards, um, pets are sometimes given the opportunity to escape and oftentimes they do take it. And uh, I'm just kind of opening that up with that illustration to think about like, uh, why do pets do that? Um, is that how they're wired? And then why do we as pet owners, or maybe if you have livestock, you care about your animals in a, in a similar but also slightly different way. Uh, when they get out, why do we pursue them? And I think um, most pet owners, of course, this is maybe not the, you know, uh, this painting broadly, most pet owners uh, pursue their missing pets because they love them. They want to be with them. And they know that the wide world is not kind to stray cats or stray boa constrictors, stray dogs. <laughs> um, and they, the owners want to be with them and care for them. And so most times it is lamentable when pets run away. Um, and it's loving for their owners to put up signs, to scour the neighborhood and to ride around and talk to people. Have you seen Sparky? Um, scour near and far, and it is likewise, so here we're bridging to the parable, silly and lamentable when humans, we as humans, run away from our Heavenly Father. There is something in us, in our wiring, which is bent toward escape, and that we can dart suddenly away without thinking. The door opens, and we're like, boom, we're gone. Or with slow and careful deliberation, we can dig under God's fences until we get a hole that is big enough that we can squeeze through. Our study this year shows that God uses many creative people, creative ways to seek those who have escaped from him, who have run away, and he is calling them back to himself, lovingly pursuing him, um, lovingly pursuing them so that they might learn to be willing to stay in his good care and to know that that is the very, very, very best place for them to be and to flourish. And so we're going to see tonight, we've seen this in the book of Kings uh, so far, uh, first Kings, and now we're into second Kings, but we will see that God lovingly is intervening. He's putting up signs, miracles of word and action. He's intervening in history. He's calling and equipping people to go about his business of pursuing and, and scouring the neighborhood, um, equipping prophets to call people back to him. And so this week, I think as we study 2 Kings 2 through 3, I think that we can learn that God lovingly pursues us so that we might know him and we might pursue him back. God lovingly pursues us so that we would learn to know him and learn how to pursue him back. 
So our outline tonight is two divisions um, put cleanly at the chapters, where we'll see God equipping Elijah in 2 Kings 2, and then we'll see in 2 Kings 3, God reveals his power both to rescue and to judge. So um, we're going to open up your Bibles. We're going to be in Kings or turn them on. Um, remember last week we were in Chronicles. So we have to sort of think about where we are now in Kings. Kings is a different narrator. He has different goals and purposes. Um, and so the Kings narrator focus, as we've gone through First, first Kings and Second Kings, by the way, in the Hebrew Bible are one book. So when I say Kings narrator, I'm assuming that it's a complete whole with one voice. Um, and so King's uh, narrator's focus has been on the northern, more idolatrous kingdom of Israel up in the north. And Judah has come in a little bit, but not a super lot. The focus has been on Israel. Um, the kings have rejected God and caused his people to sin. And so we're entering now with God's rescue mission. He is um, pursuing the, his people. It's well underway. And so of the multiple prophets that God has sent to Israel to call his people back to him, Elijah has been the most prominent. And so we saw Elijah come onto the scene and intervene with King Ahab. Remember, there was a famine, a drought for three years. There was a big showdown at Mount Carmel up there. Um, and sorry, that was loud. Um, and especially it was about King Ahab's worship of Baal. And then most recently, Elijah has intervened with Ahab's son, Ahaziah. I'm probably mispronouncing that. Um, but that was 2 Kings chapter 1. And so we had a change between 2 Kings chapter 1 and 2 Kings chapter 2. There's a new king in Israel, and Ahaziah didn't have any children, and so his brother, who was also Ahab's son, uh, Jehoram, or it's also translated Joram, uh, has become king. And so that's where we are picking up in um, the lens shifts away from the kings, and we're going to see now Elijah and Elisha working together. So um, this in the, or, so let's just go ahead and get into chapter two. Um, we're going to see in this section the literal mantle of leadership, prophetic leadership, is passing from Elijah to Elisha. We've heard about Elisha, and we've already seen him before in First Kings 19, uh, chapter 19. Remember, uh, God chose Elijah when he was on Elisha when he was on, when Elijah was on Mount Horeb, that he said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahola, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. So Elijah has been serving for a while, knowing that Elisha is going to be his prophetic heir. And so we did see that. We went through it very quickly because we've been going through these chapters so quickly, right? But Elijah threw his cloak over him. Evidently, that was the anointing, I'm guessing. Um, and uh, presumably since that point, Elisha, he forsook, literally that's the word in Hebrew, he forsook his oxen and he followed after Elijah. And so presumably he's been doing that up to this point. We, the lens just hasn't been on him um, in Kings. So now we're going to turn to Elisha. And like Elijah's ministry, Elisha's ministry, Elijah, I'm sorry, I'm going to get mixed up with those two numbers. Elisha's ministry is characterized by words and signs. And both of those words and signs are not meant to be just in themselves, but to point to a larger spiritual reality that would serve to direct God's people and you and I as we read the scriptures back to the Lord, toward the Lord. And so there are, um, in these chapters, there are many possible parallels, especially of Elisha to Jesus. We don't have time to really explore those, but just know those are on, the, we have Elijah parallel to John the Baptist in the New Testament, and Elisha does many miracles that will remind us of Jesus' miracles, things that he did. So just to put that in frame, we're not going to really follow that thread. But, um, okay, so this chapter two, we have two parts of it. We'll see God preparing Elisha in one last journey, and then God is going to confirm Elisha's leadership. So the first part in um, verses one through 11, God is going to prepare Elisha, and um, we'll see uh, the narrator tells us right away what's going to happen. Now when the Lord, verse 1, was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And so that first part, 
the narrator is telling us what's going to happen, um, that Elijah is going to go up into heaven, and that's a unique end to an earthly life in the Old Testament. We might talk like that now in Christian circles, that um, people who pass away and they're believers, that they're going to be go up to heaven and be with the Lord. In the Old Testament, people didn't talk like that. At least it's not recorded in the scriptures that way, um, that Either they would be, like we saw with David in 1 Kings 2, verse 10, they would go and sleep with their fathers. They would be buried. So it was sort of a going to rest in a down, like, or maybe in a cave somewhere. Um, or elsewhere, more poetically, sometimes people would be talked about when they die, they would go down to Sheol, the kingdom of, or the, like, the land of the dead, where the dead people are. Um, and so that doesn't mean that faithful people in the Old Testament were estranged from God. And like in Matthew 22, verse 32, Jesus speaks of God as the God of the living, not the dead. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we see on the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 17, 3, that Moses is there. Moses died and was buried by the Lord in um, Deuteronomy 34. And then Elijah is also there uh, in the... Um, in that company when Jesus was transfigured on the mountain. So, but this is really unusual and it hasn't happened since Genesis 5 when Enoch went up into heaven or went up to be with the Lord. It's very enigmatic in Genesis 5. So these are, Elijah is one of only two people recorded in the Bible who did not die but were taken up into heaven. So this is sort of a big, big theological deal. Okay, um, and so the narrator helps us anticipate the miraculous nature of that to say this is by a whirlwind or a storm. And so um, then we, we learn, we're, we kind of enter knowing what's going to happen, and it seems like Elijah, Elisha knows about this too. Um, as we get into this, verse 1b through 12, the narrator is going to take us on this journey in anticipation of this event. Um, there's much more focus on the journey than there is on the actual supernatural event of Elijah being taken up in the chariots of fire. And so we're joining Elijah and Elisha. They're going from Gilgal to Bethel, then Jericho, and then to the Jordan River. And so we're, we're kept on the outside. We don't know the inner thoughts of Elijah or Elisha. Um, and so there's some very enigmatic parts. Let's just read um, some sections of that. And there's repeated language, verse 2. Um, so they're walking. We don't exactly know where Gilgal is. It could be north of Bethel, kind of along the mountain ridge, or it could be down lower in Joshua. There was a Gilgal closer to Jericho and the Jordan River. So I'm not sure exactly where that is, and I don't know that scholars know for sure. Um, so Elijah said to Elisha, verse 2, please stay here for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elijah said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, yes, I know it, keep quiet. And so we repeat, Verse four, Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, da, da, da. So we see that exact narration. Um, please stay here. No, I'm, as the Lord lives and you live, I will not leave you or forsake you. Um, and so abandon um, uh, or forsake is definitely a key word in Kings. And it, so it's what Elisha did when he followed Elijah. He forsook his 12 oxen, which was a big deal. That meant a lot, of, that was a lot of money. Um, to, you know, to slaughter them, forsake them, to follow Elijah. But we also were, so we're going to go on in 2 Kings. Sadly, spoiler alert, um, this is what God's people in Israel and Judah will be charged to do that they have done to the Lord. So forsake is a very covenant-laden word uh, in Kings, and it's probably supposed to evoke that. Um, to follow God is to forsake all other paths, and he calls us to be faithful to him. Um, just as he does not forsake his people. And so the pattern breaks then, they're going on this journey, um, and it repeats, and it breaks, the pattern breaks in verse seven, when they get to uh, the Jordan, then we see there some prophets stand and watch from the distance, so maybe they anticipate that the time is getting close. Um, and then in verse eight, uh, then Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water, and the water was parted to the one side and to the other till the two of them could go over on dry ground. 
And so um, this is a similar, this should evoke for us a similarity of a Elijah to Moses. We've already seen that on Mount Horeb, there were some similarities. So it may recall Moses leading his people out of a land of slavery. Um, we don't know why, the narrator doesn't tell us explicitly why this is going on, but that, just that it happened. Um, verse nine, when they had crossed, Elijah says, said to Elisha, ask what I shall do for you. Um, actually, the, in, it's like, the, it's imperative, ask. What shall I do for you before I am taken from you? So he's, he's charged Elisha to ask him, um, similarly to what the Lord said to Solomon in chapter three, ask, what shall I give to you? And Elisha said to Elijah, please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, you have asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it's, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And so, um, what, is going on, what, what is going on with that? Um, there are a lot of questions, and I don't, I don't have good answers for them. But there is, it seems to be, in a double portion, that is language that an eldest son would receive from a father. So they have a father-son relationship, and the inheritance that Elijah has to give to Elisha is not a physical inheritance, not a land inheritance, not money. Um, well, actually, there is a cloak that he does get, but it's a spiritual inheritance. Um, and so it evokes the sense of a final blessing, like we've seen with Moses or with Joshua. Um, why is this thing hard? It's not clear, but I will say that the, however, how Elijah answered, it probably made Elisha follow him even more closely. Like, he probably didn't take his eyes off of, of him for, like, blank, blank his eyes at alternate times so he wouldn't miss it. Um, I, I, just only slightly. And so, um, and then we very suddenly, we see that uh, verse 11, as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen, and he saw him no more. And so, two things, the text explicitly establishes that Elisha did see so we can infer, as Elijah's word had been confirmed by the Lord so many times, what Elijah said was true. So Elisha has received uh, a double portion of Elijah's spirit or probably spiritual power. And the second thing is, um, God was in this. This was a supernatural miracle. Fiery images, military images of um, flaming chariots and, and horses. And we'll see them later in uh, Kings as well. Okay, um, the second part of 2 Kings, God is going to confirm Elisha's leadership. And so the narrator relates four confirming signs that God has appointed Elisha as the spiritual heir of Elijah in his ministry. And these miraculous signs are like, I will say, all the miraculous signs in the Bible. They are never meant to be just in themselves, but always to point to a larger spiritual reality. And so when you and I read this, we might think, wow, how random, this seems really weird. But we should be asking ourselves, what does this say about the Lord? What does this say about us as a people? What did the people who originally received this, what did they need to understand from this uh, mere miraculous sign? A sign you never just go and hang out. Well, sometimes, I don't know if you've gone to, like sometimes if you get into a state or something, you get out and like take a picture like, welcome to Florida or whatever. But you don't stay there, right? You're not gonna just hang out by the welcome to Florida sign. You're gonna continue on and like go to the beach or to Disney World or visit your grandma or whatever you're doing. And you're not gonna stay at the sign. And so I encourage you and I encourage me and I encourage us together um, to seek the greater spiritual reality. And I, I will say this too, our culture is often skeptical of the supernatural. And so these things may sound like folk tales. They may sound like things that are just made up. And I suggest to you that the supernatural is exactly the point. They're miraculous. They are not, they're not supposed to, we're not supposed to be searching. Cooperative readers aren't gonna be looking and finding, oh, what was the natural? Oh, the bears were rabid. That's what the situation was going on. This is, uh, this is pointing us to the Lord um, and to focus on not the miracle, but what it means. Okay, sorry, that was a long intro. Um, four confirming signs. So we see in verses 13 through 15, Elisha is going to part the waters of the Jordan with Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him. And then 16 to 18, Elijah is going to be 
Elisha is proved right when Elijah can't be found. He has been taken up. He, so Elisha has true insight. Um, Elisha, in verses 19 through 22, uh, restores his approach. There's a problem in uh, the water, it seems like in Jericho. And so he restores, he brings blessing and healing for what had been cursed and had death in it. And then in the uh, 23 and 24, uh, in the fourth account, we will see that uh, Elijah's words of cursing in the name of the Lord are confirmed. There is a, an animal that comes and attacks those who um, jeered at him. It's a difficult thing. We'll, get, we'll maybe get to that. I'm sure you guys will talk about it tonight. Um, but that the Lord, the Lord follows up. The Lord has established Elisha's word. And so we can really see the main points of this by following, I think, the direct speech um, in these sections. Verse uh, 14, Elisha cries out, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And then um, the miraculous sign confirms, like, here he is. He's with Elijah, Elisha. Um, and the, the eyewitnesses of this event in verse 15, the sons of the prophet, um, confirm the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. Um, and then in verse 18, we see that um, the, uh, Elisha says that, you know, they send out men and he can't find Elijah. Did I not, did I not say to you, do not go? <laughs> like, Elisha is somebody that you should listen to. Um, and, you know, it'd be better to listen to him than not. And then uh, verse 21, we see that um, he, he pronounces healing. And as he pronounces it, so it does. So his word follows, the, the action and the word are together. Thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From now on, neither death nor miscarriage shall come from it. And verse 22 tells us, confirms, that this has happened even to this day, whenever this day was um, based on the, in the literary whole. And then we see this uh, in verse 23, a little on the different side, go up you bald head, go up you bald head, or some translations translated baldy, go up baldy, go up baldy, um, get out of here baldy. Um, uh, go up is a command that most often happens, is given from someone of importance to someone of lesser importance. So a king would say that to a servant, uh, the Lord God king, he would say that to a prophet or to someone. Um, so this is, there is seem to be a, I mean, I don't have fun discussing that, <laughs> um, but it does seem to be disparaging to God's confirmed prophet. And so to dis disrespect God's appointed prophet is to disrespect God himself. And so um, this, this scene, the bears come out. Um, so uh, verse, I'll just read verse 24. And he turned around, that's Elisha, and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys. From there he went on to Mount Carmel. So he went up, and then he came back and returned to Samaria. Okay, so um, the scene with the bears is hard to read. Um, there are things I do not understand about it, but I do know this. We have, it seems that the narrator has set, especially the one, the event that came before it and this event in tension. That um, God is not just a God who takes judgment. God is a God who heals and restores those who seek him. Rebellion against God does have adverse consequences, but the fact even that God speaks about this means that God wants us to know as readers that he, uh, he is someone who takes rebellion seriously and he wants us to respond rightly. And so that I think is a sober warning. Although God is gracious and long-suffering, he does not owe us second chances. Um, principle for, uh, a principle I think that we can learn, through, there's so many things, right, that we could learn, but I think one of them is that God equips those whom he calls. God equips those whom he calls. Um, and as we, as we think about it, this, where this chapter is, it may, and the events of it may uh, surprise us. And for those of us who are Christians, uh, our first inclination is often to assume that those who most need to witness the power of God are those who do not know God or follow him and his son Jesus. And so we think about pagan nations or, um, you know, the, say the northern king of Israel or whoever that might be um, in our context. But this text reminds us that sometimes those who need the most assurance regarding God, who he is, and his sovereign power 
are sincere Christians who are striving to cooperate with God's mission in the world. And so like Elisha, like the sons of the prophets, may have you, maybe you have been serving God and following him in an already costly way, but now things seem to be changing. Key leaders are retiring, um, felt problems are changing, are morphing, um, and you are facing a crossroads of sorts um, to keep serving where you are in a known place, doing known things, or following down a new, harder path, a costlier service to Jesus. But to walk down that harder path, you are going to need a greater faith. You are going to need to know who the Lord is in a greater way and have your trust um, increased. You need your trust muscles strengthened significantly. And maybe even you are, um, you know, these stories about God's power and his love, the colors are less vibrant than they have been. And maybe you have begun to doubt them, doubt God's power, doubt his love, doubt um, the importance of his mission. Um, And in, in order to move forward, friends, you and I are going to need to be reassured of God's mission, of God's majestic power, of God's pursuing love, of God's provision for those whom he calls. Because Elisha is gonna walk a harder road. Elijah had a hard road, he had a hard ministry, but Elisha is pursuing a nation that is more committed to forsaking God. There are fewer and fewer people who have memories of going to worship and serve God in his symbolic palace in Jerusalem and more and more memories of going up to Bethel or to Dan and worshiping a golden calf and saying, okay, that's the Lord, that's good enough. Um, And this is a harder road. Um, Elisha could never have walked this hard road with God's power. And the hard road that's in front of you and me to follow Jesus in this world where it is very hard and not popular by a long shot, uh, you and I need to know who God is, and we need to be trained to seek him and have eyes that are trained to look for the things that he does that are small and not, you know, not chariots of fire, though he could do that, right? Um, But to see the small things and the answers of prayer and have our our faith strengthened. Um, God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. Um, You and I, by the way, are not Elisha. We are not Old Testament prophets. Um, We're not kings. Um, but you and I have been created in his image, and he has a purpose for your life and mine. And I wonder how God has called you to serve him. What evidence has he provided to you that he is trustworthy, that he is powerful, that he is loving? And how has he left room for faith? Because he will always do that. He will provide sufficient evidence, but he will also always leave room for faith and force you to not rely on your skill, ability, your bank account, your relational connections, but him. And I'll tell you what, friends, like I'm doing that now with this lecture. This lecture is not how I had hoped or wanted, but, and the, you know, I'm praying like, hey, Lord, what am I supposed to say? And it doesn't come, so I'm trusting that he is going to do that. So hopefully you'll see that and not my, not my weakness and adequacy. Okay, um, and we can praise and thank him for it and encourage each other. God lovingly pursues us so that we would learn to trust him and to pursue him back. Okay, let's go on very quickly to our uh, second division where God reveals his power to both rescue and judge. And this chapter, we're going to shift tone completely. Well, almost completely. And so um, we had been watching this kind of our lenses on Elisha, and now we're going to be focusing back on, um, you know, uh, national level Uh, conflicts, domestic uh, or war alliances of the northern and southern Israel. And so there are many parallels with the early alliance that we studied in 1 Kings 22. So I hope you'll have a good chance in your groups to talk about those. Um, In verse 1 to 3 of chapter 3, we get a stylized assessment of King Ahab's son, Jehoram or Joram. And so these are using a lot of the same words that we've seen the other kings described as um, in verse One, in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Jehoram, the son of Ahab, became king over Israel and Samaria, and he reigned 12 years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, or literally in the eyes of the Lord, though not like his father and mother, for he put away the pillar of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, 
he clung to the sin of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin, he did not depart from it. And by the way, that sin of Jeroboam was to create, instead of having people go to worship the Lord in Jerusalem at the temple that, the, that Solomon had built, instead, Jeroboam put uh, an altar and golden calves in Bethel in the south and Dan in the north. And that was, you know, oh, it's too hard for you to go to Jerusalem, but go to one of these places, that'll be fine. So that was the sin of Jeroboam, by the way. Okay, um, and so verse 4 to 27, the second half of this, we're going to see uh, the king of Israel, um, who is not usually named as uh, Jehoram. I guess he is in verse 6. Sometimes he's just called the king of Israel. He's going to pursue a rebellious vassal kingdom of Moab. And so you can see Moab is down in the south, uh, a southern neighbor to them. Um, by the way, um, Moab's rebellion was first introduced in in. Uh, chapter 1 verse 1 of 2nd Kings. So this has been going on a little bit, little while, if we take that chronologically. And um, verse 4, by the way, uh, names the king Mesha, the king of Moab, was a sheep breeder. And um, there's an archaeological, I mean, obviously that's a picture up there that I just printed out with my highly technical skills um, of the Mesha steel. It's the Moabite inscription, and it's the earliest archaeological evidence that we have of the God of Israel, the Lord, who is named. Um, and it names this king, Mesha, and he, you know, he, it was probably before these events because he's speaking very like, oh, I had all these victories and King Omri oppressed us, but I did all these amazing things. So uh, anyway, you can check that out. And if you're in Paris, you can go see it in the Louvre. So there it is. Um, okay. So um, verses uh, four to six, so there's Moab is, uh, was a, um, a vassal kingdom. They were subservient to the king of Israel. And we see um, he had to deliver the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. But when Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. And so, of course, um, you know, what, do you, what does an over king do when an under king rebels? Well, they have to do something, right? You have to respond in some way. This is what King Jehoram did. He marched out of Samaria at that time and mustered all Israel. So Samaria is up there in the central and the hill country in the west of uh, the Jordan. And he went and sent word to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, the king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to battle against Moab? And he said, I will go. I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. And then so they make plans um, which way should they march? Um, by the way, the wilderness of Edom. So I guess they're going around south, aren't they? Which is an interesting path. I'm not sure why they um, did that. There was probably a reason. But uh, so we're, we're sending this. There is an irony here. There is an over king, the king of Israel, who has an under king. And that king has rebelled and said, I will not give you what I'm supposed to give you, the 2,000 sheep product things. And so that king, Jehoram, is like, we're going to take care of this. But the irony is that you and I know as readers is that King Jehoram actually is an under king himself, that he is an under king over King the Lord God. And so here there's, a, there's an irony that's going on. And we're going to see God reveal his power to both rescue but also to judge. What happens to an under king who is persistently rebellious? What is going to happen? Um, okay, so, um, sorry, I'm wrapping up, promise. Um, and so uh, the Lord God, as Israel goes out against Moab, the Lord God king is pursuing his wayward, rebellious under king. And so um, we then, they get into a crisis in verse nine, so the king of Israel went with the king of Judah, and lo and behold, he got another ally, the king of Edom, which is ominous. And then they made a circuitous route march of seven days. There was no water for the army or the animals that followed them. Okay, so again, we have, just like we had with Elijah, here's a life-threatening crisis over water. And so here we go again, what's gonna happen? The king of Israel said, alas, the Lord has called these three kings, I guess he's talking about them, right? To give them into the hand of Moab. And so he interprets this as the Lord's judgment. 
Um, so that's partially astute, right? To recognize that the Lord God King uses natural events for his purposes, and yet he misses the point. This crisis is an opportunity to turn to God, stop rebelling against him. Um, King Jehoshaphat thankfully knows better than that. Um, and so he says what we've heard him say before, um, is there no prophet of the Lord here through whom we may inquire of the Lord? And so lo and behold, yes, there's Elisha, and he comes in verse 13, um, Elisha's message about the Lord. And so um, we'll just read that, I guess, uh, 13. And Elisha said to the king of Israel, what have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and to the prophets of your mother. But the king of Israel said to him, no, it is the Lord who has called these three kings to give them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, were it not that I have regard for Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would neither look at you nor see you. So do you hear like Ahab's house is their time is running out. They're almost at that. They've pushed God's grace almost to the end. Um, but then Elisha says, but now bring me a musician. And when the musician played, the hand of the Lord came upon him. Maybe that's supposed to echo, echo uh, Saul, perhaps. And he said, thus says the Lord, I will make this dry stream bed full of pools. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind or rain, or that, but that the stream bed shall be filled with water, so that you shall drink, you and your livestock and your animals. This is a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will also give you the Moabites into your hand, and you shall attack every fortified city and every choice city, and fell every good tree, and stop up all springs of water, and ruin every good piece of land with stones. So, um, what should the king of Israel have done at that point? Um, what should the king of Judah had done? We get very little, we, in fact, we get no response from either of them that's recorded. Um, instead, we see right away from verses 20 to 27 at the end of the chapter that God is fulfilling Elisha's word. The Lord not only meets the need for water, so he rescues, but he also uses the, Mo the water to lure the Moabites into a vulnerable space. And so verse 24 to 27 recounts the battle and its consequences. There's violence to the Moabite people in the land according to what the Lord had commanded, violence to Moab itself, a fury that suddenly repelled Israel before the conquest of Moab is complete. And that's, um, yeah, there are many difficult passages or difficult questions that the passage raises and few of those questions have tidy answers. A part of us should grieve that the world is violent in such a way that if the Bible didn't portray violence, it would be irrelevant. To have a field full of stones and your water source blocked or contaminated, your family injured or killed, these are things that have happened and are happening right now. Right now, they're happening. Um, but perhaps the Lord is letting us lament, lament the fuller sadness, the greater consequence of a world stubbornly rebelling against its overking so that our hearts might long for redemption and healing and restoration, that we might see our own rebellion against the overking in turn before we too are judged. And so, um, yeah, just to wrap up, I guess, um, we're in a different period in redemptive history. There are echoes uh, perhaps of Joshua and the Canaanites. Um, many of us come from Gentile nations who also have rebelled against God and provoked his anger, but we see God's loving pursuit of even his enemies in this. While we were yet his enemies, he sent his son Jesus Christ to die and rise again so that we might enter his family as full citizens. Um, a new people with Jesus as the cornerstone and the battles that we fight in his name are not physical battles in this way, but they're spiritual battles. And for most of us, that includes or is, should be directed at the sin within our own hearts, put to death the old self um, and removing the plank from our own eye versus looking at the speck in somebody else's. So a principle I think we can learn um, from this, the right response to God's grace is repentance. The right response to God's grace is repentance. What is that? Just to turn, to turn back to him, um, to start pursuing him versus going on our own way. And I wonder, have you ever been in a place where you were moved to desperate prayer in a cancer ward before an interview when you got a devastating text 
Um, what has been the aftermath of that? I think we see in our passage, our chapter, a negative model. This is how not to respond to grace um, from the desperate place, anticipating the Lord's certain judgment. But aha, uh-huh, it turned out fine. So I guess we can go on our merry way. Um, and afterwards, silence in verse 27, um, Israel says uh, they withdrew from him and returned to their own land. Um, and the lens shifts immediately back to Elijah and to more normal people. Forgetfulness and back to normal. That's the wrong response, like the nine of the 10 lepers who did not turn and thank Jesus. Um, apart from God's grace, my point is, isn't to say like you're forgetful. I presume you're forgetful because I'm forgetful and I think we're all forgetful. We are forgetful. So I'm not trying to guilt you. Don't hear that. Just acknowledge, yeah, you are forgetful. Um, but two applications that are in light of the gospel. How and when has God already helped you remember? Already helped you remember how he answered prayer, how he was kind to you, how he was gracious to you. Um, that the fact that you remember is evidence of his work in you. And second, um, what habits uh, are you able to reinforce or establish towards remembrance? We don't just happen to remember. We, remembrance takes deliberation and effort um, and to walk with greater faith in repentance. Um, and we can say, okay, that is work and it is hard. And yet the Lord, that's work that the Lord calls us to do, to remember and to praise and thank him and to um, go into the, the places where he sends us and calls us to be the hands and feet of Jesus in such a way that we will trust him and glorify him. Um, God lovingly pursues us so that we would learn to pursue him and know him. So just like the pets of even the most loving owners, we are inclined to try to escape from the Lord and his good boundaries, and the wide world is not kind for us. It's not good for us uh, when we stray for him, and he loves us and pursues us. He sends others after us. He will even equip us to go and be a part of his pursuing, rescuing mission. Um, How has God been pursuing you? How has he been training you to seek him, to, uh, to trust him, to serve him, to love him back? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for uh, your kindness. Thank you for um, how you have shown that you are committed to your people and your character. Pray, Father, that you would help us be people who cooperate with you, who walk in repentance, who remember, and who are gladly willing to submit to you and to walk the harder road. In the name of Jesus, we pray in his name. Amen.